very well. Now, I have mentioned before, when I was um, telling you about the um, Citadel Guard and the fact that you can have this um, building that's obscuring the, the line of sight and it's preventing the uh, Citadel Guard to, from shooting at the barbarian horsemen. So let's, let's take the Citadel Guard and uh, let's have it shoot at the barbarian horsemen. Let's put the barbarian horsemen in a situation where they can indeed be shot by the um, Citadel Guard. Because I want to show you that you can have different weapons in, uh, in the game. So, what's the weapon carried by the Infernal Dwarves Citadel Guard? It's a flintlock axe, which has um, 3 plus aim, range 18, strength 4, and armor penetration 2. It's quite a nasty, uh, nasty weapon with strength 4 and armor penetration 2. 3 plus is a, is a good aim value, it's on the, um, the aim value of a skilled uh, elven archer. The range is a bit short though, 18. So let's see what's the range that we have these guys in. So this is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. So they are definitely within 18, but they are past the 9 of the, um, of the uh, short range. And actually, if we try and make things more fun by doing this, exactly, you will see here that this dwarf here has the entirety of the unit of Barbarian Horsemen in his line of sight. And this is the same thing for this other guy here. But what about this guy here? They're still in the front arc, but as we said, there's um, there's a hindering terrain in the middle of this forest. If I take a meter and uh, place a meter over here, for example, right? And I show you what it is that this dwarf is seeing you know, the, the 45 degrees of this guy here. Anything that's behind the meter, and uh, as I position it to show you where the angle with the forest is. You see this angle here? This angle over there? All right. So let me position the meter in a way that, yeah. So anything that it's in this part of the line of sight cone, is going to be obscured. So this is obscured by the forest. This guy here has no problem in seeing the house. That's okay. He sees the house all right. But if he's looking over here in this area from here to there, it's going to be covered by the corner of the forest here. Does that make sense? Hmm? So that means that the unit is covered by the forest for this guy here. I think that if I rotate the meter here in a way that shows you what this second dwarf is seeing, so I take the furthest away corner on the base of the dwarf, so this corner here, I take the corner of the woods, I trace a line, and I notice that I see two and a half models out of three in the base, so that's okay. This guy sees all right, but this guy has a penalty. Okay? So let's put together all these penalties because, you know, things can start and be quite complicated. This one, two, three, four guys and the guys behind them uh, are just in long range, long distance from the barbarian horsemen, so they only have a minus one. These two guys here both have a minus one because we are past the nine inches mark, but they also have a minus one because of the cover. Okay? So instead of hitting on a normal three plus, like these guys would normally do, you are hitting on a four plus for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight of the dwarves, and you're only hitting on a five plus for these two. All right? So let's roll dice. We need a five plus for these two behind the behind the forest. And we need a six and this is really you know happy moments when this works 
And then we roll eight dice for the other guys, and they only need a four plus because they had three, but now they're in long range, so he moves to four, but they're not behind the forest. And with the four plus, we make six. Oh, this is, this is, a, this is a really nice roll. So six here and two uh, for these two other guys, it means eight total. <coughs> Sorry. Now, eight out of ten wound. This was a really nice roll. Um, eight out of ten hit. They don't wound, they hit. Now we have to see whether they wound. And we said that the flintlock axe has a strength of four, and the barbarian horsemen have a resilience of three. So this is fun, because now this means that four minus three strength minus resilience is one so it means that i'm wounding on a three plus okay so i take these eight dice and i roll and i look for three pluses and i make seven it's a lot of them it's a lot of them wow uh so a uh, ten dwarves shoot and eight hit eight hit and seven wound Let's have a look at the armor now. So, Barbarian Horsemen, we said that they have a nice armor. They have armor 4, right? This is good. 4 is a high number. But, if you noticed, the Flintlock Axe has an armor penetration of 2. So, the formula, the magic formula for armor saves, don't make me be polemical about that, is 7, the magic number, minus 4 of the armor is 3. But then I add to this three the, the armor penetration of the uh, flintlock axe, which makes it four and five. So these barbarian horsemen are saving themselves with a five plus. I have to roll seven dice, and each result of a five or six is a wound that the armor of the horseman is being able to save. Otherwise, they just die. And I make three five plus, I make a five and two sixes. So that means that this is a wound, this is a wound, this is a wound, and this is a wound. So it's four wounds, which means that this guy is dead, this guy is dead, and this guy is dead. There's a fourth wound that gets discarded because it was just, it was just overkill, it was just overkill, okay? So that's it. That's um, that's an, um, a small example of how uh, weapons other than the regular longbow work, but that doesn't mean that um, that um, it is not interesting to look at what bows do, because for example, something that I that I find to be very interesting here is some specific types of Right. So, for example, let's imagine the situation of the fight between the Highburn Elves archers, these guys who are over here, and the Sylvan Elves archers. Okay? And this is not at all to pick a fight with people behind the Sylvan Elves book and to make you notice that the viability of a Highborn Archer has nothing to do with that one of the Sylvan Archers because we are not going to be polemical in this video. So, you know, they're just elves, just cousins, and they work in very, very similar ways. So, for example, we said, look at that, follow this thing. We see that this um, Citizen Archers here, if they want to shoot at the, uh, at the uh, Sylvan Elves here, they cannot do it. For multiple reasons. Reason number one is that they're away, uh, too far away. They're beyond the thirty um, inches of the uh, of the longbow of the citizen uh, citizen archers. But they're also out of the um, line of sight. So what we need to do here is to make a uh, wheeling movement by I don't know four, and then I advance by one. I've been a bit imprecise there. That's okay. Because here now, I can check and see that I'm in uh, within the 30 inches for being able to shoot at these guys. Okay? So now, 
This means that um, I can shoot, instead of using my aim value of 3+, plus, it's going to be 4+, plus because I wield and I advanced, and it's going to be 5+, plus because I'm in long range. Okay. So these 10 guys over here are now going to hit on a 5+. Uh, plus. And what's interesting is that in the same situation, uh, the same situation, the uh, the silver nashes here. You see that they are past the thirty inches mark, so they cannot shoot at the uh, at the high bone uh, archers here. But if I advance with these guys by I don't know, let's say three over there, and now I am within thirty. You would say, well, you have a long bow, so the aim is 3+, plus, 4+, plus because you're in long range, and 5+, plus because you've moved. Well, no, no, because these guys here, they have a no-to-hit modifier for moving and shooting in their Sylvan longbows. Huh? This is really interesting. Bows are not the same. The same Sylvan longbow, for example, has no modifier for moving and shooting, so this is promoting you know, a type of play where the uh, the silver nails are moving a lot and picking the targets. It makes a lot of sense given the uh, the flavor of the army. And it also has armor penetration 1, uh, which the uh, highborn longbow does not have, has armor penetration 0. So against models which have 0 armor, like the silver archers, this doesn't really play a role. But, you know, you could say that the Citizen Archers of the High Elves have an armor of 1, so they're a bit stronger than the Sylvan Archers. But, yeah, if your opponent has armor penetration 1, then it kind of nullifies that. Huh? I'm being petty. New players have to know that this is part of the game, you know, complaining about one unit being stronger than another. And if you go to the Ninth Age forum, oh, you're going to see that this is a big part of the forum. It's a... In-game, it's comparatively... Yeah, quite a quite a small deal compared to what you see on the uh, on the forums. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Now this modifiers thing can uh, can become really really um, uh, can become really important in in some in some specific cases because for example, let's have a look at the skeleton archers. Okay, now the skeleton archers, as we said in some other video, I suppose they. You know, you don't really see a skeleton, like, you know, getting the bow and aiming and going for the target. It, a skeleton doesn't have that level of agentivity and of own will. So just, like, you know, doing mechanically the thing and then the arrows are flying in the sky and they're landing on the opponent, guided by the will of the hierarch or necromancer that is leading these skeletons into battle. So that means that they have... Uh, a set um, aim value. Their bows have a range 24, strength 3, armor penetration 0, always hits on a 5 plus. So I haven't moved, I haven't moved, I'm in short range, there's no cover, the uh, skeleton archers here are shooting at the citadel uh, archers there. It's 5 plus to hit, right? That's okay. But if you are shooting, at, like, you know, if you are in this position here and you make a uh, wheeling movement so that you can see uh, this unit here, uh, who are those? Those are mm, imps, all right. You see this unit here and they're far away and there's a unit in the middle and there's a and there's a forest in the middle, and uh, this unit is hiding behind the forest, and uh, I have moved, so I, I should have three modifiers, right? No, that's just okay. This long bow, this bow, always hits on a five plus. No modifiers applied. So you know that's that's interesting. Different factions have different types of weapons, of shooting weapons, and that makes the game uh, just about more fun. I would say. Right. Now, before I conclude, there are just three other points 
that you might want to keep in mind when uh, thinking about shooting. And, uh, you know, as, as, as a beginner player, you have realized that none of this is made for the uh, advanced tournament player. And these three um, things that I, uh, that I want you to, to remember when playing your first games is, number one, um, you can use your shooting not just for killing uh, enemy models, but also to play with the uh, morale and with the discipline of your opponent. Because something that's really important is that when a unit loses 25% um, of its wounds, like for example this 2 out of 8, 25% or more, or for example this wound out of 3, this is 33%. Yeah? When you have this type of casualty, um, the unit has to test for panic. So that means that when the Dryads lose two wounds, you check the discipline value. The discipline value is eight. So you take two dice and you sum that result. And you have eight. If you have your discipline value or, um, or a smaller number, then you're fine. If you have more than that, then you're in trouble because the unit might uh, flee away. For example, when these Knights of the Grey lost one wound, they have Discipline 8 as well. Oh yeah, do they? Oh, strange. Well, I'll, I'll double check that later on. I roll the dice and I make a 3 and a 6. Woohoo! And so that's a 9, and a 9 is higher than 8, if I remember correctly. And uh, so this means that these guys are turning away from the archers that have shot them. So they are rotating on the spot and they are fl fleeing away. Uh, let's remove this thing because this is a bit annoying. And, and they're going to do a flee movement of 2d6. So let's roll 2d6 again and we roll a 6. Okay? And this is what a 6 is. Okay? This means that the Knights of the Grail, I can also show you with the line of sight here. You see the blue line there? So that means that these guys go up here. Had I rolled a 7, these guys would be dead because they would have fled out of the edge of the table. And uh, that's it. When you, when you have one pixel uh, when you have one pixel out of the edge of the table, then uh, your unit is just dead. And, you know, this is more than one pixel, largely more than one pixel. So, you know, you just inflict one wound, but if you're lucky enough that you um, force a panic check that's, uh, that's failed, well, you could, you know, really do a lot of damage. So use shooting in, in a clever way and you know try and get some uh, panic checks when you when you have the chance to to do so in some cases you cannot do so in some cases you can never force a panic check and look look at this unit here unit of zombies like 25 percent is a lot <laughs> i know it's like seven models that you have to kill in one turn plus some units automatically pass uh, panic checks like zombies who have this undead special rule so if you want to know how to use shooting in a clever way think about panic which unit of the enemy you can put into uh, into a flight mode think about the units where you cannot do this so your archers are going to play a very different type of game whether you play an army which is immune to panic or one uh, that is not immune to panic so this is one of the uh, one of these three things that I wanted to um, say in conclusion. The second thing is that using terrain to your advantage is going to make all the difference between you know a general who knows what what he or she or it is doing, and uh, and you know the beginner who hasn't given enough thought about any of this. Because you can position your units in a way to be shielded as they advance towards the enemy from fire. You can position them within a type of terrain 
that's going to give them the advantage. So, for example, here the Citadel Guards can shoot without penalty out of the wood that, uh, that it's in, but the uh, imps here are going to shoot at the Citadel Guards and they're going to have a penalty, right? So same thing when like you know moving around houses like position yourself in in a clever way use other units to shield um, to shield your um, uh, your targets so the weaker the target is the more protection you might want to give it for example this is one way of thinking it so dryads have resilience uh, four and archers have resilience three. Dryads have Aegis 5+, plus, and Archers do not. Uh, they just have no protection. So you might want to make it so that these are behind the line of uh, friendly units so that they can be protected from enemy fire, for example. And in general, I mean, that's, that's just, just talk to your, to your opponents and to your friends and think about stuff. Uh, this, this is part of the fun of the game. I, I remember having long conversation, uh, conversations with my, uh, with my gaming partners on what is the first target that you shoot at when you start a game? Do you shoot at the uh, largest enemy unit to try, and make it, uh, to try and make it a bit smaller? Do you uh, shoot at the, um, uh, at the most heavily um, armoured uh, with special protection types of units? Would you do that, or would you rather shoot at the fastest unit? That's the one that's going to be in your line and messing with your capability of shooting altogether, and so on and so forth. You have to think a lot on how to make the uh, the shooting phase um, really work out for you. There's a lot of thinking that goes into that, and even with a, with a quick starter, with a lot of simplified rules, it doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of... Um, depth of thinking about this dynamics here all right so um, you know i guess that um strangely enough i think that i have more or less managed to say um all that i wanted to say so um, i keep it short and just say bye and to the next video try guys <laughs>